Welcome to a unique episode of the Archetypal Mosaic. This is Sir Mikhail Tank. On the phone I have a dear friend, a fellow Jungian, a fellow healer, a leading nurse, and a nurse artist, Kathy Iwanowski. Welcome. So Kathy and I started out getting to know each other by both studying Carl Jung's incredible work. How do you feel about Jung in general and what have you learned, what do you use in terms of Jung's work in your daily life? You know, um, what was really interesting is that when I was working on my master's degree uh, for fine arts and interdisciplinary arts at Goddard College in Vermont, I uh, was started the projects um, really coming from a nursing perspective, and it was about wholeness and what affects our perceptions of wholeness. And the kind of work that I was doing, um, I realized, um, really kind of, I say, hit a deeper vein. And while I was doing some additional research for my uh, artwork and my projects is when I came across uh, Carl Jung's work. And just everything about uh, that I was reading about him really seemed to, you know, strike a chord for me. And I realized that I needed to maybe pursue that a little further. Um, when I was in nursing school, uh, they really pretty much just studied um, Freud. And so uh, to come across you was really um, quite exciting um, as it applied to my work, um, both as an artist, but also as a nurse. You know, I... I love Freud and Jung equally. They're actually my favorites. And um, I had a chance to meet Jung's gra uh, grandson, and I, I just, uh, on Twitter, had a slight interaction with Freud's great-granddaughter, who I hope to one day interview or collaborate with. Um, now, in terms of Jung and nursing, now, you have been a leading nurse in certain facilities overseeing large... Um, nurses and large faculty, um, the concept of healing, you know, um, it, it's so strange because there are so many wonderful nurses who do it from the heart and also because it's a well-paid job and it allows you to go anywhere. In so many countries, you can get a, a visa by nursing. Um, but nonetheless, you know, nurse, people go there with different intentions. Some people do yeah. it because of money. Some people want to move to a different country. But um, you really embody uh, you know the healing aspect mentally spiritually physically how do you combine all of those things so that you can become the kind of nurse one can only hope for you know um i feel like you said i've been a nurse for quite a long time and uh i actually thought i was going to um hang up my nursing cap uh so to speak uh, when I went to art school for my master's degree, and it was during that process, which I think that's what master's degrees are all about, is about learning about yourself, is I came to the realization that I will never lose that aspect of myself of being a nurse. And that aspect for me throughout the years has really been about nurturing and caring, um, educating, and I was really uh, quite a bit, uh, especially uh, when we were both, you know, studying um, Jung and um, archetypal studies. I I came to the realization that, um, and that's kind of why I add visionary onto what I am. Also, mm -hmm. I realized that um, my whole body and soul is really about how do we as human beings, um, how do we evolve and what will our evolutionary be in the future? And I, I've come to the realization as a nurse and an artist that I have to be a part of that. I'm very interested in, um, in how we are going to be in the future and um, how can I affect that in the most positive uh, way. Um, so it's been um, a very interesting uh, journey, and I, I know that I'm still on that journey right at the moment of how to find the best place to do that, who will be my, you know, who will be my audience, who will be the people uh, that I will be able to work with uh, to um, affect that uh, positive um, outcome. So um, in many ways, maybe I would be considered futuristic, too. I think very much about, uh, like I said, what, how will we evolve and what would the future of humankind be? And tell me, what makes a great nurse? <laughs> 
Uh, I think there's all different, you know, concepts about that. Um, I've been a nurse again for a very long time, and my whole pers- purpose of going into nursing was to care about uh, poor people. And I also realize I'm a, um, an educator, um, and there's many times throughout my career in different positions where I've actually used the term midwife. Um, I'm very fond of that term and very fond of the concept uh, that I have for it, and that is that um, as a nurse, we uh, can birth. Uh, so to speak, uh, different things for different uh, people. You know, uh, a lot of people think about uh, midwives as only being um, associated with new life coming in the world, but I've been a hospice nurse also, and I considered myself a midwife um, at someone's passing, that someone needed uh, someone to be there uh, with them to um to acknowledge and honor and respect the life that they had uh, and their passing also. And so uh, I think that uh, when I think about myself as, as a nurse, I think at the heart of it is about being a midwife, how to help uh, people to um, pass through whatever situation they're going through to the best of their ability. I have to say that there's been many times when I think that I've helped people who Uh, because I saw something in them, some strength, some skill uh, that they might not have seen in themselves that I was able to help kind of, you know, support and uh, give them uh, maybe another vision of themselves. And I think that very much, again, fits back with the work of Jung, right? It it was about uh, being able to um, look at a whole person, um, all aspects of them, and find that part that um, that can move forward, that uh, can take these what seems like diverse and uh, uh, dichotic um, sides of ourselves, bring it together and form something new um, that we maybe never expected out of ourselves before or seen in ourselves before. You know, uh, you brought up a lot of great points. I want to ask you about the midwife thing. Where does the term midwife come from? What does it actually mean? So in nursing uh, right now, uh, midwives are really associated uh, with the, the care and birthing of the mom and the baby. Um, and uh, I think uh, midwifery really uh, started um I'm not an expert in it, uh, but a lot, a lot longer than we think. It's not from recent times at all. You know, there weren't a lot of doctors around, and as a matter of fact, I believe that probably midwives were just women who had experienced um, birthing babies before, and they were the ones that were there. They were probably the grandmothers, the you know, the aunts, the sisters, the neighbor woman um, who was in a community where there was not a doctor available to help with the birth um, of a baby. But I look at, uh, as I always have again throughout my life, at the, even the word birthing. Uh, is it just a physical act? And I don't think it is. I think birthing um, also uh, is a, has a place in how our thoughts you know, come about and how we move forward in life. Um, uh, when I was working on my master's degree, you know, some of those finding a deeper vein kind of things, I was doing quite a bit of study about depression and grieving and even with um, that part of being a midwife is um, I think also applicable to helping people to um, pass from this one aspect of who and what they were before. We're constantly changing and evolving uh, but sometimes we get caught up on who we were and what we were in the past when we need to move forward. And having someone, uh, even if it's ourselves, I think we can midwife ourselves, so to speak, um, if we have the uh, ability and capability and the um, and the tools to do that. Uh, but having someone else um, available to kind of go along with us, you know, like a guide, be, be side, by, side by side with us to help us through, um, you know, difficult dis- uh situations, and they don't don't always have to be bad situations, you know, sometimes the changes that we are making in our uh, our lives and in ourselves um, uh, are not always a bad change, they can be a good change, it's just that how we saw ourselves in the past and how we're going to look in the future, which we're unsure of, can be kind of scary for people, uh, whether it's physical, changes, spiritual changes, emotional changes, mental changes, 
Um, again, I think about it as a holistic um, aspect uh, for for people, um, including myself. And I'm definitely on that path myself of making these kind of things and coming through those kind of changes of that's what I was and I, I liked it, but I know I have to change and this is where I'm going. So I, I just love it. I just love um, the, the concept. I love the work um, that's being done. And uh, again, to go back to Carl Jung, I just feel like I wish I could have met him uh, because of the different aspects that he was able to bring um, creatively. And I think that that's something that, that really ties you and I together also uh, in our work of Jung is that creativity aspect. Now, let me ask you about something. First of all, I want to say that midwifing ourselves, which you coined right there, would be a wonderful <laughs> book title, by the way. It really would be. Um, <laughs> Now, my question to you is this. You also brought up something beautiful about midwifing a passing on. And I always yeah. use the term passing on, which I learned from my Rabbi Shimmel from my made a film, because it's really, you never know what the next stage is. It's never a way. Um, now, ab about the passing on of the... So, you know... We've been taught and we've heard from many people that we constantly got to kill that ego, kill that ego, kill that ego. I disagree. I've always disagreed. I think ego can be an exceptionally healthy, nurturing, powerful, unique individual um, totem. Strong, strong way of finding your individuality as long as it doesn't overtake and become hubris. So when somebody passes on and you're midwifing them, Let's say their ego comes out in a way, or what is that part that goes, here are all my stories, let me give you the bank of my life, the bank of my stories, and I'll tell you all my wisdom and how great I was at this, how people loved me at that, how many marriage proposals I had, etc., etc. And let's say you're, you know, talking about that on a regular day and during coffee, and people are going to go, boy, that's an egotistical person babbling about themselves, but... The other way to look at it is you're sharing your your life's truth, you know, to somebody before they pass. Have you experienced people who've given you their bank of wisdom, and how did you decipher not to take it as ego? I don't think I ever did, and that's what's kind of interesting. You know, it's so interesting that you brought this aspect of that up because... Uh, while being a hospice nurse, I, I observed a lot, and I learned so much um, along the way um, from both my clients, their families, and just different instances and experiences. And one of the things that I came to observe was it seemed like there were two types of people or, or kind of uh, scenarios uh, when people were leaving this world. And it was either the person who was very, um, like no one wants to die, you know, we want to live as long as we possibly can, uh, most of us, uh, and, um, and so there, there, but there's people, there were people that uh, were very angry about what was happening, uh, and I found it to be kind of a coulda, woulda, shoulda uh, type of a thing, and they were just very angry that they didn't take advantage of that opportunity and this thing and, and whatever, and um, were just miserable uh, for themselves they, their atmosphere around them was miserable so it's very difficult for their family then there was the other person and I think this kind of fits in the category that you're mentioning and that was the person who was like I don't want to die but you know I look back on my life and exactly the kind of thing you said you know I heard of but I, I tried this and it didn't work but you know I'm really glad I tried it or I traveled the publishing that said that spent that money on that, but I did, and, you know, uh, I have a good family, or I had a good job, or, you know, I had these other situations. They didn't all have to be good situations. People um, were able to say the things that didn't work out, that they, they tried, but it didn't happen, or, you know, uh, kind of experience. I never saw it as ego, but, uh, but it, maybe it is, but I never saw it that way. I just saw that there were two scenarios when I saw people passing. It was either that angry coulda, woulda, shoulda, or the person who uh, experienced life and um, took life as it was coming to them, and sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't. And 
that was just such a fabulous learning um, experience for, for me as a nurse and as a person. Um, that I think was uh, part of the reason why I decided to uh, go on and uh, work towards my art and that creativity and thinking about how can I take these skills that I've been given, these gifts that I've been given, and use them to the best of my ability. And I had the same kind of feeling about it. I know that some things are going to work and some aren't, but, I, but I'm sure going to try. I'm sure going to, you know, take advantage of as many things as I possibly uh, can. Maybe that is ego. Uh, but I've never seen it as a negative part in those situations. Now tell me, you brought up another really good point, woulda, coulda, shoulda, the bitterness. Where do you think the bitterness yeah. comes uh, comes from, and how do you think it is, is a good way of dealing with bitterness? <laughs> you know, you ask really good questions today. Because, uh, you know, when I was working on my master's uh, thesis, um, one of the qu other questions I had in regarding that um, are perceptions of wholeness. And at first, my uh, when I was going after perception of wholeness from a purely physical aspect, and, and as you can tell from my conversation, went in a, a bunch of other places that was much more holistic. So how perfect was that? And part of uh, that then was a question, which I think kind of fits in with, with what you just asked me, which was, where does hope reside? I wanted to know, how does, how does somebody have a sense of hope uh, and I think that fits in with the coulda, woulda, shoulda. Somebody who has hope, I don't think has the coulda, woulda, shoulda attitude. But the person that there's something that keeps pulling them forward despite the negative things that might be happening or the disappointments um, uh, in their lives. And then there's the other person who either had hope and how did they lose it or they never had hope and were they able to get it? Um, and I think it's the person who's the coulda, woulda, shoulda that might not have a full sense of hope. Mm. Or have, you know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They might have a little bit in there, but not enough reserve mm. of that sense of hope to pull them forward into those things that they might have been fearful about. Do you think hope and faith are one, uh, they go hand in hand, or are they a little bit different? on that. To I me, think, uh, I think for me, you know, I look at it from, I think it is somewhat tied, but I, I don't have enough, uh, I haven't done enough research or kind of looked into that, delved into that uh, more to really see. For my own self on a personal basis, I think so. For I me, think for me it is connected. I think they're very parallel in my just from from my perspective. Um, hope uh, hope is something you choose, I think, and faith is something you uh, intrinsically um, have. Um, I think uh, hope is more mental and faith is more spiritual. But you never know. I mean, it's different for different people. Um, let me ask you about boundaries. Now, being a nurse and a caregiver and an artist. Um, I'm certain that there have been situations and people who felt like, oh my God, she's helping me. I, I need to rely on her and I need to um, fully, you know, become codependent on Kathy. And how does Kathy decide while still helping people to have her own boundaries? experience, you know, when you're first a, a young caregiver, um, I think even a young mother or a young father, someone who hasn't had uh, experience yet uh, with life and situations, I think um, it, that, that melding of boundaries can happen very easily. But I think as you have life experiences and uh, you come to know yourself better, right? I think um, that you're able to really start figuring out the boundaries. Like, where am I? Who am I? And where do I kind of end? And where is the other person, you know, 
begin uh, kind of thing, and being able to then um, either preemptively set up the situation so that you know when you're clarifying your boundaries, or during the interaction of uh, being able to set up, uh, you know, uh, particular uh, boundaries. And I, I think it's just from, you know, um, living, living life and figuring out those kind of uh, situations. Um, I'm the oldest of 11 kids, so 10 siblings, and um, I think that helping to raise them also kind of helps you to develop that earlier that maybe somebody doesn't have a big family. I don't know because I've only been from a big family, uh, but I think that, that kind of adds to it too. Uh, but it is a very hard situation when you do care for someone and you want the best for them um, as a nurse. Uh, to to set up those boundaries and feel comfortable about setting up the boundaries, you know, kind of goes with that uh, the previous um, uh, what do you call it um, thought, thought or theory on a tough love. You know, in a way, it's kind of like that. Uh, also, that you you care about someone, um, but not to the detriment of yourself. You know, it's kind of like the oxygen, you know, falling down out of the thing. They always tell you to put it on you first before you help the other person, and uh, I, that is a learning experience. I think I don't know for uh, everyone, but I know that for me, that. How it developed. Well, let me ask you a small, a small follow-up on that. Do you have a, have you developed a psychological mechanism where when you feel like your own air or oxygen, figuratively speaking, is being taken from you, that you just shut it off from any from any outside influence and you go, it's Kathy time. It's Kathy time. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, for the last couple of years, I've uh, been a manager um, in wellness services uh, with the Visiting Nurse Association here in Denver. And so I oversaw, you know, 50 plus um, registered nurses um, who were from all different age uh, groups and experiences, plus seven um, administrative staff. And uh, when I when I'm working with them, I'm giving my all. I'm giving more than a hundred percent. And some of my staff sometimes would get worried that you know Kathy should have given a lot of herself. Um, I hope she's taking you know care of herself. And I would always clearly state to them that if that's anything that I've learned over the years. Is about, I know that I'm the type of person that gives more than 100% to people. But I also know that Kathy needs uh, that recouping time, it needs time to herself, needs time to shut down and shut off um, in order to um, recycle myself, recharge myself. So I would assure them that, that I, I knew myself well enough that uh, if I still had the energy, I would tell them I could give it. If I didn't have any energy left, I would say, you know what, uh, I, I don't have any more to give, you know. Uh, I wanted them to understand that I could be honest about that for myself, that if I told them I can still help you out on something or I can work on the weekend for you if you need help, that I meant it. I wouldn't offer it if I didn't have that, that uh, reserve in myself to do it. Uh, but again, that took, again, years of uh, really starting to define uh, those kinds of things for myself, those boundaries, and getting to uh, know myself and honor and respect who I am. Uh, I, I kind of call myself an extroverted introvert uh, because how I recharge my batteries is to have alone time, to um, read, to uh, contemplate, um, you know, to create, uh, but totally in my own space on my own time. And I found that it is, and help my family to understand uh, that when I'm given those opportunities to recharge in that way, I'm I'm a great person for them uh, when I'm when I'm there for them because I have all that energy. I applaud you for saying extroverted introvert because I'd have to say that's another thing you and I are um, equal in. I mean, I've never used that terminology before, but I could now say, as Kathy said, an extrovert and <laughs> introvert, because that fits me exactly. Now, let's talk about mandalas. You've, um, you've created mandalas, and they've also been a, a big part of Jung's work, and you were doing them for quite a while. Um, tell me, you know, mandalas... Aside from bringing 
peace both to you and whoever sees them. They're very intricate labyrinths. I mean, they have a tremendous amount of layers and depth. Can you describe uh, the layers of a labyrinth or um, layers of a mandala? Well, you know, uh, that's interesting, too, with uh, coming across, uh, I did not realize that Jung had done all this mandala work, uh, but uh, I, for a year, uh, did a mandala every day. I was going through some huge transitions in my life, and I just felt like I needed something to kind of ground me. And I didn't um, do kind of the traditional designs uh, that I had been seeing of uh, other mandalas of just repetitive um, uh, geometry, repetitive symbols and things like that, although some of my mandalas during that year were, were totally like that. I, I really kind of considered them more uh, what I call freeform mandalas, meaning that I just used the circle as my center of focus. But I allowed whatever came out, just like somebody who would be journaling, uh, free, you know, free association journaling or whatever, I would just allow to what could come out into that space. Uh, there is a lot of layering, and I think that that complexity is a big part of me as a person. I know I'm a complex and deep person. And so I know that that's some of the things that uh, came out in those uh, mandalas also. Uh, some of the mandalas um, I did were using stencils even. I had maybe not very much energy or not very much to start from on that day, and they used stencils to get me going. But I think what was very fascinating uh, at the end of the year and looking back at those mandalas, I know for a fact that during that year I had some very low periods. I had uh, some days that were full of fear and what's going to happen, you know, uh, regarding a job or a move or whatever was happening during that particular time and just feeling very lost and, uh, you know, unfocused and ungrounded. And when I look back on all of those mandalas, I have to say that the thing that was very interesting to me is that here we were talking about hope earlier, right? Hope and faith. The mandalas always maintain this brightness to it, this um, kind of illumination to them. Uh, whether they were simple or complex, very layered or not, uh, and I found that fascinating because I, w I would have thought that during that time, if I'm feeling down, my mandala's artwork would have been looked like, you know, uh, dark skies and, you know, things ahead. And I'm not saying that some mandalas didn't have some dark sky aspects in it, but the overall, the mandala itself was still bright and everything. I came to the realization that, uh, and that's what I so loved about our studying of Jung's work, I realized that there was something else inside of me coming through this artwork to talk to me, to inspire me, to keep me elevated, to give me those, that sense of hope and, uh, and also uh, testing my faith and things like that. And that I came to the realization, uh, whether you want to use the word spirit or soul, I know that that's what was influencing my work. Because if it was me on that particular day in a fearful mode, in an angry mode, in a sad mode, I would not have created a mandala that looked like that. Something else from within or without, channeling through me as a portal, was helping to create those mandalas. And I, I, that just, I just made them even more wondrous uh, to me. And when we were studying Jung and seeing his mandala work and, you know, looking at his work in the Red Book, um, just was just such a fabulous uh, kindred spirit connection for me. Just, just a fabulous connection. You know, talk about soul. You know, that's been my favorite thing for since I was a kid. And, you know... Um, I tell people who are close to me, I don't usually broadcast this, but the fact that as a, as a person I'm very average in most ways, but, um, but I know that my soul is, is very deep and special and old, and I can feel a yeah. big difference between that because 
uh, first of all, I have a very specific situation that happened when I was young, too, uh, that happened, which is a whole other story. But aside from that, um, around the age 12, 13, and this is about art and healing, which this show is about, you know, Dark Soul, which a lot of people misunderstand when they hear me say that I do Dark Soul, Dark Soul Theater and Dark Soul Music. They go, ooh, that sounds devilish. And I'm like, no, 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 you're missing the point. The point being that um, through all the darkness, it boils, you know, it boils yeah. like magma and it, it turns into brilliance and light and creativity. But it can't just be all smiles and hee hee hee, everything is perfect kind of thing because yeah. that's bull. Uh, it has to go through that phase, through all those phases in order to morph into, into the natural brilliance. And as a 12, 13 year old, you know, as a young teenager, you go through so much identity crisis and stuff, and boy, did I as well. But um, the Dark Soul Theater and Dark Soul Music, which you can hear on Amazon and iTunes and everywhere if you go online, um, um, is all about healing and turning dark into light. That has always been the, the way. Uh, a couple of metaphors I used before were like using a flashlight to the soul, which sounds redundant now, but. But, you know, and I didn't know who Jung was when I was 12 or 13. I had no idea. Um, right. But the work that he did in the Red Book and in so many other places, and the work that happened through me or and you and all of us who are seekers, it's a similar process, just naturally. It's not a following thing. It's like, oh, you do your work. He does his work. I do my work. And we are the source. We are connected to the source. And that's the beautiful thing. You know, there's so many people who... They spend their time, uh, what do you call that, D dis dis uh, discrediting. They discredit Freud. They discredit Jung. They say, you know, you can't prove the unconscious. You know, sexuality cannot be the basis of humanity. And blah, 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 blah. And all they do is sit they and what I call argue with the dead. And we have experienced yeah. this firsthand in certain places and I was so tired, so tired of people arguing with the dead, and I'm just like, you can why don't you respect the source and just come up with something else that's that's that can elevate other people as opposed to just bagging on people. I mean, what's the point? And so um, the whole point of art and healing and Jung and unconscious and nursing and all these things, these are the reasons why you and I have become very strong kind of friends who don't have to stay in touch all the time but the point is that we share these incredible keys and we are seekers yes, yes. now it's so, it's so interesting uh, Michaela what you're talking about in your expo explanation for your uh, dark soul work you know uh, I have had situations where I'm in this liminal space I'm in between what was and what's going to be and for me, it's like being a ship in on a sea, just white out, just mm -hmm. all white out. I can't see my hand in front of my face. And at first, it used to be a very hard experience being in that place. It, and I'm not saying it's 100% easy yet, but it is easier uh, because I know that I come out of that space and I've learned something or something is waiting on the other side. Where again, previously being in that dark space, uh, quote unquote, was scary. Uh, I felt like I had no grounding, no, you know, nothing above, nothing below, nothing to the sides, to the sides to guide me. You almost have to stay during that space within uh, to, to make, uh, make that, you know, transition uh, to come through to the, uh, to through to the other side. Uh, the other thing I think um, that's interesting in, in what you were saying uh, was about uh, that aspect of um, why are, why do we argue about the people who have gone before us and like you said, whether there's a, a conscious or unconscious. If in your own personal life you have found certain things to be true, and I think that is part of that secret part you're talking about too, is, is about being out in the world and figuring out through your experience, through what's ha what you're observing out in the world, witnessing out there, um, to be, is that being like a truth? 
Um, and then is that something that I would like to kind of hang my head on and carry that along with me in my little bag of tricks, so to speak, or all these little uh, truths that I found, you know, as being a seeker. Um, I think that it's fabulous. And I, I don't know about for you, uh, but I know for me, what I've found through the years by, by, through art and creativity is conversations start opening up, discussions start happening from these spaces that people might not have words for yet, might not have a concept associated with it, um, but are able to put down a color, are able to uh, get some kind of a sound out, uh, do some kind of movement, any of those expressive arts uh, uh, terminologies um, that I just, for myself and the others, I've witnessed that art and creativity can open up these discussions that may be difficult, that people didn't know where to start from. I don't know if you've had that experience. You mean art? Of course, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, art is the healer. I mean, art is the closest thing to, I think, to God in the sense that um, because I do believe in God and I do believe in, in creativity, I think creativity yeah. is simply our small version of godliness. And um, I like the way that sounds. You know, sometimes somebody, you say something, I say something, and it's like it, it has a little gold ring to it. So creativity is, <laughs> is, our, is our, whatever I said, it just feels right. It just, it's our little godliness. And um, there's a big difference between ego godliness, hubris, by saying, I am so great, I'm like, oh, God forbid, because I would never say that, you know. But at the same time yeah. saying, um, I appreciate the creator, but I'm so glad that I can co-create. And, and that brings life. I mean, it, yeah. it really does. It brings life to people. It brings life to the self, to the soul. And it's a way for... I mean, I know that it's a, my soul is happy because I create. If, if yeah. I was to be repressed and unexpressed, uh, my soul would be pretty angry with me. And here's the thing. If, my, if your soul is angry with you, life can start getting kind of angry. Um, but when your soul is, is kind of satisfied, um, there's a different perspective. Yeah, you know, I think that soul part in me is that co-creator part you were talking about. I think that it wants to experience as much as it possibly can. It can only do it through me. It can only do it through you. It can only do it through another person in its own personal way. We each have our own soulness that is specific to us. And... I think that that's why, you know, there's so much discussion out there about, oh, why should I, you know, create this? There's already a zillion other artists or creatives creating that. Yes, they might be painting that same red barn, but your barn is not going to look like the other person's red barn or the 50 other people's red barn. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, because of, because of you and what you bring uh, to that experience or in your situation with your performances. Yes, there's a million other performance artists out there, but they do not bring that same uh, that same material soulness uh, to their work. And I think that that is what's really important as an artist and a creator, creative is to remember that. You know, that there is that's something unique to you that you are supposed to be doing with those gifts. Absolutely. Bravo to that. And to our audience, not only are we talking about Kathy and I, but we're talking about you. You know, each of you has gifts and um, don't be afraid to create. Create beautiful things. Create what your soul wants to say in a positive manner so that you can feel joy, extra joy. Um, Kathy and I are going to share our websites with you so that you can see our work. Also, um, I believe that you can request both of us for, um, I don't know about you, Kathy, but I think that we're both available for uh, public speaking, for teaching, for private counseling. So um, uh, check out Kathy's website, which is kathyivanoski.com. Can you spell that for our audience? Yep, so that's Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y. 
Iwanowski, I W A N O W S K I dot com. And yes, I'm open to all those things that Mikhail had mentioned. And my website is simply MikhailTang.com, and my verified social media is at MikhailTank. Um, Kathy, uh, is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we wrap up this this inspiring show? Uh, just that I think that uh, we're, we're talking about something that's very timely right now, right? And people are thinking about, you know, health care and, uh, and all of the different chaotic things that are happening in the world that they're associating with mental health and behavioral health uh, and these aspects. And, uh, again, just to think about uh, our, ourselves as human beings in a holistic way. We are not just physical beings. We, we encompass all of that, and all of that needs to be um, attended to. And uh, that's exactly why I call myself a nurse artist, is because I want to be in those situations that help attend to the whole person. Bravo to that. And also, love yourself uh, and all of your aspects, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you, yeah. Kathy, for being on the Archetypal Mosaic. I feel I feel great about this show. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me, Mikhail. This is just fabulous. You know, I'm looking at sunlight coming through my window right now, and it just feels fabulous today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>